Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the uh, Ford School. I'm Michael Barr, the Joan and Sandy Wild Dean of this uh, great institution. For those of you who are here, uh, welcome physically. For those of you who are listening online, uh, welcome virtually. Uh, welcome to today's Policy Talks lecture, which is co-sponsored by our Science, Technology, and Public Policy Program, the Department of Chemistry, the University of Michigan's Office of Research, and the Center for South Asian Studies. Today's event is part of the Ford School's annual City Foundation Lecture Series, which enables the Ford School each year to bring some of the world's most prominent policy leaders and thinkers to our campus. We're honored to be joined today by, by Dr. T. Ramasamy, former Secretary of Science and Technology for India, who has traveled with us uh, to be with us uh, here today from Chennai. Dr. Ramasamy is a highly distinguished scientist with an incredible record of scholarship and leadership. STPP Director Shobita Parthasarathi will introduce him more fully in a moment, but let me take this opportunity to thank him for coming and for welcoming the many, uh, ma many appointments and meetings he's had with students and faculty already uh, and will over the coming days. We've packed a lot into his three-day visit, and I want to thank him for being so generous with his time. And now I'm very, uh, very pleased to introduce my colleague Shabita, Associate Professor of Public Policy and Women's Studies and Director of the SEPP program, one of our very dynamic and interdisciplinary centers here at the Ford School. Shobita, along with former UM President Jim Duderstadt, founded the STPP program in 2006. She is a widely cited expert on issues related to how we govern ethically and socially controversial science and te technology policy issues. And she's particularly interested in how technological innovation and innovation systems can better achieve public interest and social justice goals. Shabita has done really interesting and important comparative work looking across national borders to provide broadly significant insights. Her latest book, Patent Politics, was published last spring by the University of Chicago Press. Previously, she published Building Genetic Medicine, Breast Cancer, Technology, and the Comparative Politics of Healthcare from MIT Press. Findings from that first book influenced a major Supreme Court decision in 2013 that prohibited patents on isolated human genes. Shabita holds her BA in biology from the University of Chicago and a master's and PhD in science and technology studies from Cornell. Please join me in welcoming Shabita to the podium. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you, Michael, for that lovely introduction. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Thirumalachari Ramasamy, who served the government of India as the Secretary for Science and Technology from May 2006 until 2014. He's currently a member of the Advisory Board on Education and Outreach for the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in The Hague. He's also an honorary professor at seven universities and institutes of national importance in India, including the prestigious Indian Institutes for Science, Education, and Research. Dr. Ramasamy holds bachelor's and master's degrees in technology from the University of Madras and a PhD in inorganic chemistry from the University of Leeds, which I should say my father also attended. He held postdoctoral fellowships and visiting positions in both the United States and UK, including Wayne State University in Detroit, before returning to India in the 1980s. He then joined India's Central Leather Research Institute as a senior scientist and eventually became its director. As Dean Barr said, Dr. Ramasamy is an accomplished scientist. He's contributed to more than 230 publications, published eight chapters in books, filed 41 patents, and developed 12 process know-hows. Furthermore, during his leadership, the Central Leather Research Institute emerged as a global leader in the field, generating the largest share of publications and patents related to leather research in the world. In 2006, Dr. Ramasamy became the Secretary of Science and Technology for the Government of India and held that position for eight years, a tenure that is quite rare and a demonstration of his excellence in the position. 
During his time as secretary, secretary, India massively increased its research and development investments. Dr. Ramasamy was also instrumental in initiating 74 new programs, including efforts to increase and attract young people from diverse socioeconomic backgrounds to study science, to bring women back into the science and engineering workforce after marriage and family leaves, and to inspire science and technology development both for and by poor and marginalized communities. He was instrumental in developing the 2013 Science, Technology, and Innovation Policy Plan for the Government of India, and he has served as the Indian co-chair for the Indo-US Science and Technology Forum, as well as the US-India Science and Technology Commission. Finally, Dr. Ramasamy has been particularly noted for his efforts to think creatively about science and technology policy in low resource settings, including research and development for public and social good with a pro-poor orientation to technology and affordability of innovation. He also makes a com compelling case for marrying collaborative excellence with competitive excellence models, and he will, I hope, discuss these themes in particular in his remarks today. Dr. Ramasamy's expertise and accomplishments have been widely recognized. He's the winner of more than 63 awards, including the 1993 Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize, which is India's highest recognition for scientists, and two of India's highest civilian honors for service, the Padma Shri for his contributions to science and engineering in 2001, and the Padma Bhushan in 2014 for his service to science. He is also an elected fellow of five academies of sciences, including the World Academy of Sciences in Trieste, Italy. Following Dr. Ramasamy's remarks, he'll take questions from the audience. Beginning around 4.40 p.m., staff will start collecting question cards. Postdoctoral fellow Caroline Walsh, together with Ford School student Jackson Voss and STPP and chemistry student Rachel Wallace, will facilitate the question and answer session. And for those of you watching online, please post your questions via Twitter using the hashtag PolicyTalks. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ramasamy to the podium. Thank you very much. I thank Fabita for that uh, generous introduction of some Ramasamy that I do not know about. Uh, thank you for those kind words. I thank the dean. I thank uh, the Ford School for this opportunity to be here today to share with you uh, my understanding of the role of science and technology innovation policy in developing countries. I also thank the department for choosing the topic for me. It was a suggestion that came from the de department. Of course, as somebody who had to add small addition to this uh, title, I added the word global perspective. But I was reminded of an anecdote in my early part of life. I did my PhD in the University of Leeds, England, as was introduced to you earlier. And I had a colleague by name Julian Edward, who was an Englishman, who had a different kind of tongue he wanted some spicy Indian food. Uh, so he used to join me with my dinner on many occasions. So I used to cook uh, Indian food in Seve. After several occasions, one day he asked me, hey, Sami, where are you getting the groceries from? I said, well, very, uh, let me say I was naive. I said, from Morrison's. From Morrison's. I said, yes. So that's, this is not authentic Indian food. This is an Indian's food. I believe my global perspective also is going to be a world view of an individual that happens to be Ramasamy. I share with you today such a perspective uh, on this science and technology in an innovation space. And this talk would have four parts. The first part would talk about the, the perceived rules of the STA policy. Of course, in the developing country framework, but along the knowledge national prosperity axis. 
And the one of the second parts will talk about the general policy directions and the dilemmas of the developing world in formulating the SGI policy. The part three will try to make a case for that collaborative excellence that Shobita talked about, for the building strategic alliances and partnerships between among the developed and the developing economies to look at the technology needs of poorer nations in the world. And the part four will present a case study in a policy perspective and present a general summary of this world view of this individual called Ramasamy. And if you look at this uh, science and technology and innovation system, uh, uh, primarily it is a knowledge triangle where the science is world over relates to an advanced knowledge. Innovation on a leadership in a usable knowledge and technology gainful and useful knowledge. Primarily, all of us would agree that science as we see as an advanced knowledge is still scholarship driven world over. Innovation in the current perspective of the world view is in a more competition driven and technology is primarily knowledge driven, market driven. When the nations have already reached a certain level of prosperity and distributed among the people, then those nations could focus on developing uh, science, technology, innovation system where the knowledge itself becomes a premium on which you invest as they focus on the knowledge triangle. But for those nations where the creation of knowledge itself is a perspective in a developed process is one kind. In a developing country perspective, we need to go back and ask, how does that creation of knowledge lead to creation of jobs, creation of value, creation of wealth as well, and then contribute to the national prosperity? Therefore, how do we connect the knowledge and the national prosperity axis in the uh, SCA framework becomes a the important aspect of developing economies of the world. Having said this, I think it is appropriate to go back and see how the science being global and scholarship driven would have a policy which aims at clearly the globally competitive positions for the nations and the people who pursue science, primarily relying on scholarship as, a, as an input. The technology, on the other hand, is contextual. It is related to the, man, the, the stage at which the society is standing today in terms of requirements. And it is, as I said before, being market driven. One could ask the question, a technology policy would aim at access to globally competitive technologies through various market mechanisms through which these nations can access them and propel them. Innovation as we see today is competition driven and in, in the case of economies which have reached a certain level of economic prosperity and national prosperity, they, it mounts on the global competitiveness <coughs> being number X in the process. But in the developing country framework, we need to really look at balance between the competitiveness and also the kinds of differing priorities for the development process as a whole because there are still gaps in the national prosperity space that need to be linked. And that's the kind of questions that I like to highlight today. If you were to look at the, the, the triangle of science, technology, and innovation, and superimpose it over the global space of developed and developing economies, there'd be different needs for depending upon the stage of development. The small countries, which are already developed, will have to focus attention on the SGA policy to remain competitive. On a, on a market space. Uh, when the domestic market is small, they have to really look at it in the global markets. Therefore, they have to be continuously uh, uh, leapfrogging upon themselves to be able to be, remain competitive. The large uh, developed countries with a large domestic market, they had to invest into STI to remain advanced because uh, you have to, many times in this global perspective, you have to run fast to stay. Otherwise, you will probably somebody will overtake you. They remain advanced. There is a position as well. And there are large economies, large-sized countries, but still in the developing economy. In their case, 
how to spread the developmental choices to people. It is not about developing an infrastructure. It's a question of how do you develop development choices to people. Becomes the key issue. The inclusiveness becomes an important dimension of such economies as well. There are small economies in the developing phase of life, and they constantly you to catch up with the world. Therefore, uh, the science, technology, uh, innovation policies in a, uh, in a global dynamics are driven by two uh, opposing elements, I must say. There was a developmental agenda. While the science is common to all of them, the scholarship activity, the technology which is related to the developmental processes for a developing country become crucial. And the countries which have a certain level of national prosperity and uh, economic space, they need to look at this x-axis of global dynam market dynamics and stay afoot in the innovation space. And uh, having said this, the developmental needs of uh, uh, science, technology, innovation policy of a developing country, yeah, it, it, it needs to go in, in a certain axis because the developing countries need them more than even the developed countries have because the needs are, uh, unfull, unmet needs are quite large. But the resource availability for the developing economies to invest into STI are not probably matching with the needs that they have. That we look at the, the, the dimension of the two axes, they probably oppose. One, uh, in terms of the needs, uh, the developing countries need more, but the resources they have to invest is small whereas the developed countries have the larger needs. Having said this, the kinds of uh, 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 differing priorities of nation states in knowledge economies vary. The high income group countries, uh, which is number 35 today, in, uh, and, uh, 43 in number today, they, they focus on technology leadership. And their focus is essentially to how to connect the high technology trade, how to connect the technology trade to get a sh global share of the high technology trade. On the other hand, the upper middle income group countries and some small economies, they need to work on the global competitiveness and leadership in marketplace. And if you look at the innovation leaders in indices in the world, the top 10 economies, eight are small economies. Uh, you would see Finland, uh, Israel, the countries which are smaller economies, where the domestic market size is small. And they need to connect their uh, innovation space to be ahead in the global market, and therefore leadership in marketplace becomes a crucial issue. On the other hand, the low middle income group countries and developing countries belong to the low income countries. I think their focus is not about leadership, it's about technologies for development, the unmet needs of development. And the crucial element of affordability and social inclusion becomes the key driving force of the science and technology innovation policy in such environments. And if you look at the technology itself, I would say there's a dichotomous role for technology. Prior to the Industrial Revolution, the world was not divided as developed and developing. But the, uh, a prior, after the post-Industrial Revolution, the world has come to be divided as developed and developing based on the ability to access technologies for intensive production. Now, uh, in that sense, it is a divider. But if you look at uh, the 20th century from the previous centuries, what differentiated is technology? And the way people live today is strongly influenced by the access to technology. But in a cultural space like my own, the Indian cultural space, for example, technology also played the role of a social lever leveler and bridging social inequities that prevailed. Therefore, the dichotomous role that I present to technology as a, a global divider and a social leveler uh, also makes technology a crucial element and therefore STA policy of governments become pretty fundamental. So if we, and I talked about the policy dilemmas of the developing world and uh, uh, if you look at the policy dilemmas of the developing world that the resources they have is fairly small as I said before. Now how much to invest in science and technology innovation as a percentage of GDP? That's a crucial issue. How much we invest? And we don't look at the gross expenditure and research and development of uh, developed world as an expenditure, but look at the gross investment of research and development for uh, the meeting the developmental needs. The how much seen How to prioritize among the two verticals, science, technology, and innovation. 
and well, how much of our investments, uh, total investments will break the pie into science, technology, innovation space. How to motivate business to invest into R&D? How to balance between the risks and benefits of innovation? How to connect technology to the developmental agenda and the priority of the nation and their own citizens? And of course, how to maximize the social and uh, public good of R&D pa while partnering the private sector? Because uh, today, science and technology can deliver R&D products with the public good, social good, strategic good, and of course, private good. And the private uh, sector would like to invest where R&D priorities will deliver the private good at the end of their uh, investment period. Therefore, how to balance them? So in terms of general policy directions of the, of the developing world, I would like to, uh, I see that there are uh, primarily five elements uh, of the SCA systems, increase the investments and emphasize on innovations, expand the R&D base, connect the science to developmental agenda, and of course, a balancing act that they will have to do the inclusion and, and competitiveness. And uh, if you look at the changing geography of research intensity of the 21st century, the, the, the 190 countries in the world could be grouped as high income, upper middle income, low middle income, and lo, uh, low income group nations. There are 35 low middle income, low income group countries and 55 low middle income group countries. And if you look at the uh, post-2000, uh, the essentially 21st century profiles, you can see that low income, uh, middle income group and upper middle income group countries are investing uh, uh, significantly such that the share of the high income group country in the overall global investments is coming down. You look at that, more figure base, you can look at the trends, the red is a high income group country share dropped down by some 82% to something like a 62%. Because that's indicating to you that even the uh, upper middle income, low middle income group countries see a need to invest into STI because they will lose the developmental opportunities. And that's a good thing, good news that happens. And if you go back and look at the UNESCO's uh, Global Science Report of the 2015, there is some good news that uh, the, the, uh, in the, at the time of industrial revolution, the world became uh, divided in some sense in terms of technology divides between developed and developing. On the other hand, the, the, this trend could be interpreted as therefore that shrinking divides in the innovation space. But even the countries relatively smaller income base uh, are investing into innovations and technology. And that's the kind of a, a, a bold print message that is emerging from this process. When you look at these uh, investments, I think any USDA policy framework will have to be based on evidence. So when you build an evidence-based USDA investments as a public policy, uh, we look at the, the kind of increasing in density of full-time equivalence of R&D professionals to serve the national citizens of the country and also to gain, in some sense, unserved, underserved markets of the world. Because the people who are in the developing country framework share common with the, the uh, unserved, underserved markets of the world, and therefore, how do we increase the density of scientists to meet them as well? And there are, uh, develop the appropriate uh, output indicators to connect the SR&D outputs to the developmental agenda, because the developmental agenda is contextual. Whereas, SGA indicators which are global may not have the developmental context in which that, uh, uh, that is positioned. You publish number of papers, publish impact factors, and so on, uh, papers, patents you take. They do not necessarily connect to the developmental agenda of this context. Therefore, how do we connect them? There is, of course, the, uh, I have told you, the, it is uh, globally, people use a global uh, the, uh, uh, gross expenditure on R&D, GRD. I think you have to look at that uh, investment rather than an expenditure in the gross investment into R&D in the developing country framework. And then co-investments, how much to the private sector, how much to the public sector will come into play, especially for those nations which have a large public and social good yet unmet. Their unmet needs of the public and social goods have to be built into the developing countries structure. And then the question of delivery of various R&D goods that are present here. When you talk about this uh, balancing between the public policies for technology in developing economies, we must remember the profit motives of the private sector 
or natural. And, and then there is this uh, uh, defense needs of uh, nations, again, are uh, very important commitments. Therefore, the profit motives and these national defense requirements are driving STA investments into various countries, uh, both in the perspective of the governments and in the perspective of the private sector for gaining market leadership and, of course, the strategic positions. Therefore, the, the private goods and strategic goods of R&D are uh, driven by the profit motives and the defense needs of various governments. Then we hope that some of that goods will percolate, trickle down into social good activities as well, social good benefits as well. So how do we balance between the social and the private good of R&D is a very challenging process. Especially when you take a healthcare sector, we have to remember that uh, there are people with the low affordability and how do we build an STA framework where the, the, the healthcare as a business versus healthcare as a service are balanced in the policy framework? And those are developmental economics, uh, very kind of fundamental. When we talk about the policy, par policy paradigms, there's always a struggle between the leapfrog innovation and the incremental innovation. There are countries which, uh, uh, for example, small economies which have to really rely on the global market. They have to necessarily invest into the leapfrog innovation such that they will be better than the, uh, the one upmanship that becomes important. And therefore, the process of innovation and then the uh, protect, uh, protection of that intellectual property and the uh, kind of benefits that will get up become important. Therefore, they focus on cooperative excellence and first mover advantages for research-led IPRs. There are also incremental and frugal innovations for public and social good. And uh, pre incremental innovation does not mean it is weak. Coca-Cola is an exact, exact example, excellent example of the world on incremental innovation over a period of time. Therefore, they will have to look at the alternative models, alternative grammars of uh, increasing the size. And there can be collaborative excellence and the social inclusion as priorities. Now, the, so when the social inclusion is a purpose of an innovation, then we have to be careful that the process of innovation is as important as the purpose of innovation and vice versa. And the dimensionality of challenges in developing countries, as seen from the perspective uh, of uh, policy bodies, I've deliberately used the word in democracies. Because in democracies, the civil society is quite strong. So you have to build your policy framework in the context of the civil society's participation. And I like to really highlight the balancing between the innovations for global competitiveness and national inclusiveness. Whereas the competitiveness, really, if you look at it in terms of the spread of the grammar of the competitiveness, it's a differentiating mindset and it's a market advantage. It has to be inventor and investor focused. And that will return on for investors, short lifespans, value maximization, but speed in a competitiveness is a USP. And there's a first mover advantage that is critical, and small economies tend to excel in this process. On the other hand, for large populations like us, we have to go back and look at inclusiveness as an integral part of the CA framework. And there, any inclusiveness integrating mindset, it is not about the market advantage, it's about availability users. It is not about inventor focus, it's a people focused. It's not return to investors, it's return to society. And the short lifespans, as we see, place with long gestation times. And value maximization has to be balanced by input optimization. And here, goodness is USP. And it is not a first mover advantage, the last mile connectivity, which is important. And there is a relevant to large populations. Therefore, SCA policy framework will have to integrate this uh, competitiveness inclusiveness agenda into the framework very cleverly. So evidence gathering for public policy system is not trivial. I have been in this policy framework in India for a while. And I know the kind of challenges that exist, especially in collecting evidence for policies. Generally, the output to outcome relationships are not easy in an incentive framework. That is, uh, you give the input today, and the outcomes, outputs happen later. And converting the output into outcome, and then the social benefit is a larger time gap issue. There's a huge time gap between the investments and the returns that society will eventually realize. And how do you presuppose when you develop the SCA policy framework, what sense of time you build? Sense of immediate time, sense of intermediate time, and sense of infinite time. And how do you build the policy framework in those processes? It's a non-trivial challenge in developmental economies. And when you talk about the, again, evidence gathering, most of the SCA output indicators on global models 
do not necessarily fit into the developmental contextual framework. Therefore, how do you build inclusive innovation and technology outcomes, references context into the indicators? So the evidence gathering for SCA policy in developmental eco economies need really a close revisit. It's a very complex slide. I won't spend too much time here. This is to confuse my government at that time when I was in the government <laughs> to uh, tell that the R&D idea eventually comes a social outcome and there's a long gestation time. Don't ask my scientists to produce outcomes in short spans of time. Therefore, I'm not having to confuse you at the moment. But I would like to only paraphrase, the outcome sensing is a non-trivial process. It's a time lag process. And there's a task of evidence-based policy building, therefore becomes to that extent difficult. Because the global SGA indicators are really input-output based and not developmental outcome linked. Very rarely, the SGA output indicators, the global models imply, are going into the societal outcomes. It is all about uh, what scientists do, what investors do, but not what will ben benefit in the process. And that, to the extent, I leave it at that stage, because I have no desire to confuse you with that slide. The, when you look at this in terms of the policy challenges and opportunities for the system, especially in contexts like the one I come from, where science, technology, uh, science, research, and innovation, in my context, is where taking place in vertical spaces. And there is very little of uh, integration in them. And, uh, and that is further complicated by cultural factors of the country. There are pluralism. There is asymmetries between deployment and development. Therefore, given those challenges of asymmetries, cultural factors, and pluralism, there's a big problem of integration. So how the policy that we develop in such environment, how to provide a basis to get a mindset changes in the science, research, and innovation space to interconnect them. Where they've taken vertical spaces, there is nothing to integrate them. And policy could provide that. And we also, if we are in a country like mine, where uh, the creating wealth out of knowledge is a crime in my society. Therefore, uh, it is it's counter to the innovation model. Saraswati and Lakshmi have to fight with each other. <laughs> and given that context, how do you exceed a cultural change? And therefore, we have to talk about an international collaboration with societies where this cultural dilemma does not exist. Therefore, we talk about the exceeding cultural changes in SCA integration by collaboration itself, bringing a, bring a, a cultural value change. It's not easy. Cultures change very slowly. Now, in a society like mine, where the civil society is very strong, the regulatory environment and managing regulations in democracies, I know, US regulates it very well. And uh, it's a multi-layer uh, stakeholder participation. There's a consensus building. And there is a uh, promulgation of laws, new laws for regulation and implementation structures. And there's always a balance between the man's way of doing and the nature's way of doing. Nature follows the evolutionary path. And man wants revolutionary changes in short spans of time. And the governments in civil societies, where civil society is very strong, are handicapped. We have, we have a big government and strong civil society, life is miserable. Uh, if you have, uh, therefore, the regulation paths are time consuming in that system. And when you talk about the high technology led paths for developing economies, I think how do we appraise the risk? How do we crush the cost and benefits? How do we have social, how do we balance social inclusion and the exclusion in access and availability and balancing between the collaboration and competition is an issue. And uh, uh, good news is if you look at the, the present development processes, last few years, the developing countries in Asia are emerging as a major investor into R&D with a 20% share into the global uh, investments into research and development, where Japan, China, and South Korea adopt a global res resource intensive model for R&D with manufacturing as focus for R&D. India adopts a, a resource optimized path and a, where our service economy is supporting the path for R&D, not the manufacturing process. The developing countries in South America are focusing on core strength of the core strength in terms of uh, agriculture as a mainstay. Now the question here is, is developed world also facing a, a sustainability challenge? 
This is a question in terms of uh, the SDA models. I would like to make a case today that for the strategic partnerships through policy perspectives among the uh, SDA systems of developing and developed economies. And is that feasible? Is that required? And if you go back and look at the global intensity of nations, they are measured only in primary two forms. What is the gross expenditure on R&D as a percentage of GDP? And what is the number of full-time equivalent R&D professionals per million population? Now, the global benchmarks are that uh, you invest about 2% of your GDP and 1,200 uh, R&D professionals per million population. Many developing countries, including India, do not match both norms on account of low resource setting. Now, having said the low resource setting, I would like to present to you, this is a database of the NESCO database we got from the World Bank data. And these are the top 10 nations with respect to the overall investments. And in the top 10, and I don't consider European Union as a nation, it is a group. And this is the data which are more recent. And you will see among the top 10 investors, there are six high income group countries, three upper middle income group country, one lone, lone middle income group country, which is India. We are the sixth largest investor. You see the sixth largest investor, uh, you go back and see as a percentage of the GDP is 0.85%. It's a little more than 0.85 because uh, uh, I know the number a little better than what I do, uh, what this uh, data will show, but I had to present the data as given to me. It is close to 1%, but a little less than uh, 1%. But if you look at the expenditure or per capita, it's a very small number. You may say, look, India is not investing enough. But you look, go back and see this number of gross expenditure R&D as a, as a uh, ratio of the full-time equivalent on this column. It is expressed in thousands of dollars per year. And the United States is $30,200. And there is this, uh, uh, let me say, low middle income group country, a uh, developing country, which is percent investments is $33,000, $2,000, less on purchase per parity terms. Therefore, a country like India cannot afford to get 2% because our number per scientist is already large. And if you have to increase at 2%, I must double the number of scientists. As simple as that. And scientists do not come in tap water. But anyway, we don't get tap water also. <laughs> but uh, uh, that this is a long-term process. And how do you develop an economy? Therefore, this question of investments has to be seen in slightly a different context. If you go back and look at the sustainability of the model of resource intensity, granted, because of the technology being very important, a lever in power equations of the world, today, if you look at the data, you will see that the manufacturing grew at 20%, but R&D investment went by 30% on a global space. So people wanting to invest. And today, because of wanting to be competitive, there's a competitive excellence and multiplicity of investments. Each nation is making investments in the same segment. And with the increasing cost of these R&D inputs, create a high cost. They price themselves as the <coughs> unaffordable for more than 65% of the population. And sustainability of resource intensive models, I think we need to examine more critically. I have 40 nations in this. And all Americas are shown in the blue. Asia are shown in the green. And the Europe is European nations are shown in the brown. And the size of the bu bubble is the size of the total gross investments. And you will recognize in this, I have separated them in four quadrants. Those nations which invest less than 2% of GDP and less than 4,000 scientists per million population belong to this group of low resource setting. And those nations which invest less than 2%, but more than 4,000 scientists by million population, FT intensive. Those nations which invest uh, uh, more than 2%, much more than 2%, but less than 4,000 scientists are F really resource intensive. This is lone country, Israel. Now, there are nations here which is intensive both on resource and FTA. Now, that's those countries which invest so much here would find it very difficult to produce R&D outputs can be met and serviced by people in this group, low resource setting, because their affordability levels are outpriced. Now, 
if you take these overall 40 nation systems and take this 4,000 population, uh, 4,000 million uh, scientists per million population, a $275,000 annual investment per FTE, and then calculate for the serving the global population 7.5 billion. What would be the total investment of the world on purchase power parity terms? $8.25 trillion per year, which is larger than the economy, GDP size of several nations in the world but four. Therefore, we need to ask the question, can these 20, 19 nations belong to the low income and low middle income group country can ever afford these kinds of investments? And, and technologies to serve these markets need to be matched to the price and envelope of these countries. And uh, they, they have to have two conditions. One is the affordability of the technology. And the second is how the technologies can be implemented. Capital to back the technologies also is important. Because the, therefore, there is an alternative policy framework that may be needed for developing countries with the developmental ambitions and resource constraints and low resource setting. Now, I done a SWOT analysis of the nations in four quadrants, and I will not go into all the four quadrants and limit my attention to low resource setting and uh, resource FT intensive models. If you look at this in terms of strength, the low resource setting gives you affordability and meeting the needs of all. The threat, uh, the weakness is weak base and weak leadership, and opportunity for them is resource optimization, and the threat for them is development bypass. If they don't invest, the development will bypass them. Look at this safety intensive model, the strength is value maximization, weakness is affordability for meeting the needs of all. The uh, opportunity leadership and then threat enable it to serve the poor markets. The question here is can we connect the two? Can we really bring the two together and the country's the ability to value maximize and uh, value maximize and resource optimize uh, can become ideal allies in strategic alliances that you talk about. And uh, countries, the large domestic markets like ourselves, could barter market access for innovation access. Like, for example, Israel, which has a small uh, economy, a model of domestic size. So this will call from migration from competitive excellence to a collaborative excellence as, a, as, a, as an alternative model. On account of the non-sustainability of the current resource models, I think it may be worthwhile to, to look at alternative to design develop, alternate models of developing affordable innovations for people-centric priorities of countries in the stage of development. I think we need to build affordability. We need to look at collaborative excellence and strategic alliances as an alternate path. I'd like to present a case study, a case study of a policy perspective of a developing country, where the only developing country I know well is my own, therefore I'll use mine, and, uh, and a possible ally for the alternate uh, resource optimized model for serving the global good. And you look at this India's uh, policy space evolutionary process, India was the first developing country which in 1958 articulated the principle, the like scientific policy resolution, which has read out, is a one and three quarter page universal document, you cannot change the full stop or a comma from it. It's beautifully drafted by Homi Baba and Pandit Nehru. It laid the foundation for science and scientific temper. 25 years later, his, his own daughter realized that in the world of technology, if you don't build a self-reliance, you're out. Therefore, she went and sought, uh, proposed a technology policy statement in 1983, focused on technological self-reliance and reverse engineering. Then we realized in 1980s, we were one of the top developing countries in science space. In 2003, we became nth player in the, among the developing countries, and uh, we moved away. And, uh, so in 2003, first time this ambition for science has evolved, increasing the gross expenditure of R&D for increasing outputs was articulated. Since then, we increased the expenditure into R&D by 10 times. That's the number we've increased in the last 10 years. So in 2013, for science, technology, innovation policy where I had a handle, it's an aspiration for nation where we talk about science, research, innovation system because they're taking part vertically, vertical spaces, integrate them for a high technology led path for India and abbreviated as Srishti, and that's a Srishti in Sanskrit means uh, creation. And India's share of total investments of the 90 low income group and low middle income group country, our share is 80, 89% today. That's our total share. So many states in this group 
cannot afford to meet the global benchmarks of 2% gross expenditure and, and 1,200 million population. No nation in the world is able to get 2% unless they had 1,200 million, 1,200 scientists per million population. India has a number of 160. Okay. Therefore, 160 to 1,200 is a long haul. Uh, the India is today the sixth largest investor, and whilst they emerge as one among the top six knowledge powers in science, as per the stated science policy, in terms of publications, we have become the fifth in the world. We are 15th ranked, we are today fifth in the world. In terms of patent, we are 27th, we have become seventh in the world. India enjoys advantages of developed R&D institutional infrastructure, like IITs, national laboratories, and, and our virtue is low expertise costs. We, we respect our scientists, but we don't pay them. <laughs> uh, therefore, uh, we keep them, uh, not, them, not poor. The ratio of, uh, uh, we take the salary of a, of a researcher or a professor as a, as a uh, number of times of per capita GDP is 20.6 times. So 21 Indians are paying for one professor in India. <laughs> so they deliver values. This is a long story. I will not talk about this. We, used to, it's a, we have a very strong civil society. At the time when we had this policy developed, we had a balance between a relatively weak government and strong civil society. Therefore, we adopted a bottom-up approach, where the bottom-up approach, the part of the civil society was done in 2013 policies, a very long exercise. I will not go into the details. But uh, that draft document was put on the, on the web, and public consultation was done. And this drafting itself was done by a science communicator, so that will reach people up. And, uh, and as I told you, the single policy goal is to science research innovation system for high technology path for India, and it integrates the science processes and is a way forward. And at this point of time, I like to highlight to you that SCA outputs generated low investments could reach many people. And I'm going to show you a small video. And I uh, the, the, this video is about somebody who has a Jaipur foot. It is a foot which costs $28 per foot. And uh, in a comparative economy, it's, the, the, it costs $20,000 per foot. And I'm going to show you the benefit that this $28 uh, foot gives to this individual. He has lost his foot. And this video, uh, we have downplayed the uh, voice here, because uh, I'm going to show one, the, one other video, the language of which I do not know. Some of you might know. Therefore, I'm careful that I avoid the words. Uh, this is someone who has lost the foot, and he has undergone the, the replacement with the orthotics. Here is a person who, is going, who says that he runs a kilometer in four hours, Four minutes and 30 seconds. I don't think I can do that. <laughs> uh, even then, I'm running away from my responsibilities. <laughs> and uh, here's a man. And I'd like to also show you This lady lost a leg in an accident. She is an actress. And she was a dancer before. And it was uh, really, uh, let me say, highly frustrating that a uh, dancer lost the leg. And her willpower was sufficient enough that she fitted herself to the Jaipur fort and dances the way she does. And is a, dancing is a lot more intricate process. Bharatanatyam is not easy, even with two legs. Maybe with a third leg, you might. <laughs> And uh, this individual uh, has uh, demonstrated two things. The power of the frugal innovation, the power that it provides to the quality of life of these two people. And uh, this was created at this low cost. And when we talk about these frugal innovations, it is not about the expenditure, it's about the value it brings to people. And uh, we have something called national innovation uh, foundation in India, supported by the Ministry of Science and Technology. And this foundation re recorded in one year 175,000 grassroots innovations of created at relatively no cost for the country. Therefore, there is a possibility to link these 
to the formal reservations. In summary, the change in your geographies of SEA landscape today have been mapped. And I think I made a case that the non-sustainability of this high resource setting in 4,000 scientists per million population and 2% uh, GDP components can become very difficult because it costs the world a lot. The policy dilemmas and challenges of the developing economies, uh, connecting it to the development processes was, I hope, articulated here. And I think I have case, a case has been paid for strategic partnership among the developed and developing economies. And I think a case study of STI policy of India uh, is presented in the framework of for affordable innovations for serving the unserved, underserved markets of the world. There's a plenty. And uh, I never use this word bottom of the economic pyramid because there is an economic model of the, uh, hierarchies we build in the economic scales. I use the word base of the economic pyramid because no, no pyramid can stand on its vertex. It has to be on the base. And the larger number of people belong to that category. So today, when I summarize it, SCA policies are developing countries in my opinion. The, 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 an individual perspective, I must say, the world view of Ramasamy is that it should make social economic sense of investments and become a science policy for people, not the people policy for science. And we also talk about public policy. I think we have to look at uh, a science policy for people. It should enable faster and sustainable inclusive growth of the nation. And I think open up space for strategic partnerships among the developed world and the global good for uh, sustainable global growth but serving also the needs of the unserved, underserved markets of the world. People say the world is flat. Could science policy serve to make it even? It is one thing to be flat, it's another thing to be even. And on this, I'd like to finish every lecture of mine as a finish with Mahatma Gandhi. It says, economics that hurt the moral being of an individual of a nation are immoral and sinful. Therefore, I would like to talk about the uh, technologies for the proper world. Thank you very much. All right, <clears throat> we're gonna introduce ourselves very quickly uh, and then be start the question section. Uh, thank you, sir, for your presentation. I think I can speak for everybody that we really appreciate you coming to talk to us. My name is Jackson Voss. I'm a Master of Public Policy student here at the Ford School and also in the uh, Science, Technology, and Public Policy program. Hi, I'm Rachel Wallace. Um, I am a fifth year PhD candidate in chemistry and also in the STPP program here. All right, so I'll, I'll start with the first question. Uh, we, uh, so we got questions from the crowd here, and we're just gonna kind of help set this up. So the first question we have uh, is that some, some may criticize uh, these, this approach to science and technology uh, focus by governments, uh, especially in developing nations. And I guess the question is, how would you respond to critics who say that countries like um, India and other developing economies should be focusing more on investments to cut hunger, malnutrition, or poverty rather than investing in, in science and technology. And the one example they give in particular here is the uh, India Mars mission, uh, the Mars mission. Okay. So why, why, should, why are investments like that important uh, when there are other problems that may seem more urgent? You would like to, to answer every question, or we can take a group of questions and answer them together? What I think we'll like? answer the questions one at a time. One at a time? Yeah. Okay. The question that is being asked about India, that was easy for me to answer. The uh, here is, when there are poorer people in the country, why should we invest into Mars uh, mission? And uh, why do you look at uh, those kinds of investments? It's a, it's a question that is in front. Fundamentally, the I think we need to segregate these issues. If that mass mission had not taken place, will the poverty be alleviated in the process? It's a question that you need to ask this question very frankly. That if you alleviate the poverty in a country as a whole, what would be the investment scope of investments? And related to this, what's the percentage investments we made in Mars? Now, let me tell you in terms of number, it is less than a percentage or even fraction of a percentage. Therefore, the mass mission for the country did not cost. Even a fraction of a percentage 
related to what we require in addressing the alleviation of the property issues. Therefore, it is not to be seen by just by not going through, will, uh, it is not the one is the cause of the other. As far as uh, science, technology, innovation policy is concerned, I think we need to go back and if we address the poverty issue, we require science and technology innovation space. We can't skip that because agriculture economy is very important. And when you talk about the poverty, the poverty is related to the income levels. It is not that we don't producing enough agricultural products. It's not that we don't produce products in the country. It is the ability to procure, purchase is an issue. And uh, basically, the science and technology innovation policy needs to address much larger issues in developmental countries, developmental economics, than only the, the issues of science alone. That's why I talked about relating the process. And I believe, truly believe, the mass mission was not at the expense of our focus on addressing the questions of poverty and malnutrition. on now okay cool thank you um so i'm gonna ask the next question um india has a hot climate as you know <laughs> um and its cities are growing very fast um and so like other cities they are suffering more from climate change than perhaps the countryside is um and so this is starting to make the cities more and more um or less less and less inhabitable um and so uh, to what extent do efforts to address this intersect with STI policy and practice? Okay. Uh, it's said India is a hot country. Tagore once said that uh, different centuries coexist in India at the same time. So India also has the coldest regions of the world. I like to correct that sentence. India is a hot country. Uh, India is a hot country, cold country, complex country. Uh, but the question that you are asking just now about urbanization. Urbanization is a threat for the world at large. And the question of how does STA policy address that question? That's, I will paraphrase it only STA policy. If you have a technology which requires large capital and access to capital, access to market, access to infrastructure are very determinant factors that will promote urbanization. If you have technologies which are downsized to be able to be met in the small size economies of villages and rural towns, then you are talking about moving the development to uh, small play people rather than moving people towards development. So the SCA policy of India talks about keeping the technologies backing cap the capital required back technologies to be minimized to be lowered such that you move the people you don't move the people to development move the technology to people so that's our approach and then in the fourth industrial revolution that the world talks about today you are able to use the digital framework to deliver technologies to even places which are further away and look at agriculture Agriculture is one sector which cannot move to cities because it requires land and uh, water and those kind of stuff. Land is immobile asset. So agriculture economy has to be rooted still in rural places. Therefore, we want to use the through SCA framework, reach technologies to farmers in villages, and that's the concept. So our next question, um, I think, is relevant not just to India, actually, but has to do with uh, pharmaceutical IP law. Oh, yeah. uh, so we have Expecting a question. Anyway. Yeah. Yes. So uh, we have a question that, about whether India and other developing countries should uh, resist the pressure to implement uh, stronger enforcement of Western IP law, uh, international IP law, when it comes to serving the public good, and pharmaceuticals in particular. OK. This is a politically sensitive question. And that too is asked, it is asked in, a, in the land where this will be hot contested. So I will give a more diplomatic answer, if you may say so. And I'll make it generic rather than a specific process. I use the word investor inventor focused 
Okay. Now, if we want to be competitive, you require investor inventory focus, IP loss of the countries that invested significantly into R and D. Would be natural to say that their uh, investments are returned, and therefore the IP loss will be in the directions in which we will raise about. Now, when it concerns the human life, when it concerns the human healthcare, okay, we need to ask a question a little bit differently. Let us take this nation openly. 18.5 trillion dollars economy. What's the percentage of healthcare cost? 16 percent? Maybe up. Up. So you are looking at, take that 18 percent of the 18, it gives you size of the healthcare cost which is larger than the GDP sizes of at least 190 nations. Okay. So, you need to ask this question internally. If the healthcare costs are to be so large, what percentage of its contribution has come from this kind of a large investment based activities? Now, developing countries like ourselves, I talk about India primarily, chose a specific idea of any innovation that moves up, greening of patents, for example should be focused on benefit to people rather than investor in inventor alone. Therefore, people centric rather than investor in inventor centric uh, policy was required in India at the time in which it was imposed. The context will change with time. So, in 70s when this was done by Mrs. Gandhi for India, India had a huge problem of all kinds of things. Now, today, India has become one of the nations from which the healthcare cost is minimized. Not only for, the, for us, for the rest of the world as well. There is a video called Fire and Blood. And that Fire and Blood is about how many lives of Africans were saved because of the anti that the AIDS problem. Therefore, I think the developing economies will have to look at not their geography, but the citizens' interest, people's interest. So I think uh, th there's not a moral issue but there is a developmental issue. I think I'll probably stop at that level. So this question comes to us from Twitter, and it's pretty general and broad, but um, what are the highest impact actions that U.S. science policy and or other larger um, S&T communities could do to better serve developing countries in the global poor? Well, <laughs> <laughs> if I know the answer, I'd be a very wise man, <laughs> which I'm not. Uh, I would uh, go back and say, as a suggestion, that uh, there are technologies for, let me say, market and trade. That's an issue that I will not for the moment open up. There are technologies for development, technologies for human welfare, and that is a slightly different segment. The, in those segments, I think countries like the United States, which invest significantly in the R&D today, with a very high capital cost, would find it hard to serve countries in Africa, countries in some other developing part of the world. And here is a wonderful, wonderful uh, SMT system, uh, which is solving the problems of the rich. We have to solve the problems of the poor as well, even in your own country sometimes. The question, therefore, is can you look at a country like a low resource system like our own, which has infrastructure, which has people, but it doesn't have so many people in resource because uh, we have 160 per million population. We can never grow to 2,200 in a few years. The question here, can we partner? And that partnership model talks about the ability to resource optimize and your strength of value maximization and see whether that strategic alliance would provide technologies which are poor. So when talking about north-south-south triangular collaboration, not north-south, where 
ultimately the products of this work should not stay with the boundaries of the two partners, but go to a third country which cannot afford to invest at all into research. And that's an opportunity that I think India like country or the US like nation should perhaps consider. Kind of, I think, related, but a little bit different. Uh, here in the United States in particular, a lot of our science and technology policy has been driven by uh, military investment. Um, I think this next question uh, relating to that is, to what extent uh, is development of we weapon technology a temptation to developing nations? And uh, I guess what is your take on letting, letting military development be the driving force in, uh, S in, S in science and technology policy? This is a very tricky question. And especially, I, I have to go back to India. <laughs> uh, fundamentally, uh, nations invest into defense out of a threat perception. Okay? Uh, certainly, the US in the present world cannot suffer from the threat perception as much as some of us in developing economies would have. Therefore, the logic of investment into the defense related research is related to the third perceptions of the respective governments. Uh, however, however, large percentage of the defense driven research has a trickling down effects on social good as well, and quite a lot of them. Therefore, uh, one need not say that R&D is only given to this vertical of private uh, R&D gold, private gold, and defense gold. Uh, fundamentally, fundamentally, the perceptions of SCA policies of different countries of the global systems seem to vary, sometimes even from the reality. It turns out that there was a study done on the SCA policies of six economies in the world. And at that time, India was also one of the studies, uh, one of the economies studied, and it was done by a very important country. And uh, I know uh, what that country's perception about the SCA policy of India was saying that our defense investments were large. That was because they look at this uh, defense development district, the DRD was uh, salary budget, which is fairly large outfit. And therefore, think of defense investments are large. But uh, as somebody who was part of the perspective of developing the SCA at that point of time, uh, I deferred with that particular, uh, let me say, assessment, if I may use the word assessment. But they're very clever that uh, the, the, the people who did this, they said, my department was focused on rural technology. So they try to silence me as well. Fundamentally, the defense reinvestments into R&D by different states are very strongly related to the defense threat perception of the economy. You can't avoid it. That's uh, I said here, private sector focuses on profit and national governments on the threat perception. Okay? They, they call it strategy. So, uh, if I take my own country, the, our investments in the atomic energy research could be argued upon. But I'll also tell you the benefit of that investment. We are now, India is one of, one of the few countries in the world which has a fast builder reactor working. And India is one of the few countries in the world worked on the closing the nuclear fuel cycle very early. And we have a thorium based reactor working. And if a thorium-based reactor actually goes into stream, we would have solved the energy problem for India for thousands of years. We have seen enough thorium. Therefore, the spin-off also has been seen. I'll stop it there. So we have a question here that um, is somewhat of a change of pace, but I, we think it's really interesting. Um, <laughs> How are current technologies, um, particularly this person was asking about bitcoins, um, how do those create challenges to technology policy development in India, um, specifically with consideration of jobs and anti-corruption? Job and corruption, okay. 
they are two different subjects yeah okay i hope job and corruption don't go as a unit <laughs> uh, it's not good for any nation in the world and uh, i will also give you a scientist interpretation of corruption in an economic space so i don't want uh, moral perception but i think scientific perception as the jobs centers are concerned let me tell you uh, between the year 2000 and 2014 i have data and uh, this is not you see sta policy is a trigger it is not a cause or a contributor to job creation we must be careful the the it's a dog which wag, wags the tail tail cannot wag the dog and sta policy is to me is a tail it cannot wag the dog employment is a much bigger outfit uh but in 2000 and 2014 there was a period of 10 year, nine years where the uh jo- employment growth was higher than the population growth and that is a result of several factors not just science technology innovation policy uh sta policy that we have built has a specific element of three things job creation and i mentioned to you before the knowledge triangle to the connect the value cre- wealth creation and job creation and also parities gender parities because uh, we have a nation with uh, nearly equal strength of two sexes but in the economic processes uh, it is uh, imbalanced and therefore we need to see that how do we get returns also from the investments made into women into a parity process and therefore the policy talks about three of them specifically in the process and i talk about the corruption and i certainly have not science, science technology policy doesn't talk about the corruption because we are free of it <laughs> but the corruption today in my opinion this is personal opinion as i said before corruption is a result of three things if there is if the demand supply gap is mismatched is a ferment for corruption if the access to supply is controlled by access to power is the next stage of corruption if the delivery of supply uh, delivery system of supply is very small compared to the group to be serviced then the supply system the delivery system gets a premium to supply so the rate of supply becomes an issue therefore what india has done in spite of all the big claims about corruption in the media in india let me tell you very frankly the percentage of population which participate in corruption one way or the other give or take at my childhood time was 90% today it's reduced the reason it is reduced is because the technology becomes a great tool in relieving the pressure on the cell delivery system so the when the uh, when i was young i could not board a train without paying some money somewhere i could not perhaps perhaps i get a ticket in the cinema theater for paying a premium today all that is digital technology delivered and therefore that has addressed but the demand supply gap is still a bridging problem therefore the way to address this corruption we should not look at it as a moral issue we should look at corruption as an economic issue we look at economic corruption as an economic issue increase the demand supply the, the need for corruption is gone make the whole process decision making transparent power access to power is gone i will tell you finish in one sentence the enjoyment of power is in abuse therefore we should not allow the enjoyment of power thank you it's, we're almost done uh, <laughs> We got a couple more questions. We're going to f- try to fit in really quick. But uh, so this one is uh, the question about the J per foot. Um, yeah. Did I say that correctly? Yeah, J per J per foot. J per is not an outcome of India's STI policy. Uh, sure. But what is the government of India doing to encourage or amplify or invest in frugal innovations? Okay. I have not claimed it's a part of uh, India's innovation policy. Uh, not said that jaipur fort is not a i think it is india's output not indian government's output and uh, let us be honest that 
countries developed by the by the effort of citizens not by the in spite of the government sometimes therefore uh, jaipur fort is a result of an individual innovation i think the most frugal innovation takes place outside the government framework that's that is true of any place in the world not just india the question that is asked what is indian government do to support them so i'll paraphrase only to that element i told you before that national innovation foundation is a, is a is an, a truly an autonomous body not controlled by the government but funded fully by the government very rarely you find a situation where the government gives money and not control is not controlled national innovation foundation registers 175000 grassroot innovations in one year that's the number now what we have done national innovation foundation framework help these frugal innovators that the several of them belong to uh, audit them acquire a certain mentors them acquire certain uh, even patent rights for them and eventually pan enterprises to leverage them and share the the, the uh, benefits to the grassroots innovator and this is fully funded by the government but we have another one this is structured arrangement we have something called power of ideas which my department my former department used to do i sometimes use the word for my department but i don't belong there anymore uh, this is problem of aging i suppose identity is problem now what happens is we have uh, the, the india institute of uh, management amrabad government of india through the department of science and technology and economic times we entered into a partnership what we do we give a call open call those of them who have ideas who want who have innovations which need to be elaborated and supported we give them a call and uh, indian numbers are uh, mind boggling always we keep the call open a uh, 16000 20000 proposals will come that's a number then we have set up something like 800 invest, invest uh, uh, experts who will assess them and see which one is doable and we shortlist them or process and when you come to through 200 300 innovations Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad, provide these innovators a business plan for taking it to the next stage, and then invite the angel investors into this process, and uh, they make pitch present pitch per to presentations to these people, and this is helped by IIM Ahmedabad, and the Economic Times, which is a newspaper, which gives a pro bono advertisement at a fairly uh, low cost no cost process, and the government of India. through my pharma department provides the seed capital of 1 uh, or 1/2 2 million rupees to really develop this into a program and uh, on the average we, through this power of idea scheme we are able to convert this uh, 200 300 ideas which come out into 100 150 startup companies uh, in a period of time and uh, we also help them to acquire iprs and protect them in the process this is some activities of the uh, government of india These are uh, still small drop in the ocean. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Doctor. We appreciate your time. I invite everybody to join us at the reception. Let's give a big round of applause. Thank you very much.